بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله ملك الجبار الواحد الطهار وشرف لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له رب السماوات والأرض وما بينهما العزيز الغفار وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله المصطفى المختار صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه الأطهار والأخيار إما بعد we greet you all to the beginning of Islam and we say to you all Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh On this evening that we ask Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala to make bless for us the title that we were given to work with this evening is entitled Rejuvenating Faith. And when we speak to the topic of rejuvenating faith, this brings us down a certain line of thought. In order to rejuvenate a thing, that thing must already exist. And also, if we are rejuvenating a thing, it brings us into the mindset of there being less of it, and we're striving to bring more of it back. So this is our discussion in the rejuvenation of faith. We understand amongst the mu'minun, amongst the believers, that faith is present amongst us, and we ask Allah to continue us upon our faith and to increase us in our faith. Amen. Yet we all have our struggles with faith, and at times our faith does take a decrease after its increase. So for this reason, we find the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam having addressed this as he would order us, as he would say, Jeddidu imanakum. Revive your iman. Renew your faith. Rejuvenate your faith. So iman is not just a thing that once you have it, it is just always present. You have to nurture it. You have to cultivate it. You have to maintain it. And you have to strive to grow it. This is the nature of how faith is. And we'll speak to the nature of Iman, we'll speak to the nature of faith sometime down the line, inshallah ta'ala. Yet, when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made this statement, or rather gave this order, Jaddidu Imanakum, renew your faith, rejuvenate your faith. The companions, they asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَكَيْفَ نُجَدِّدُ Imanana. And how do we rejuvenate our faith? How do we rejuvenate Iman? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then advised them, اَكْثِرُوا بِقَوْلِ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Frequently make the statement, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Have frequency in your statement that there, that there is none Worthy of worship in truth except for Allah. Say that often. And interestingly enough, from the varying forms of adhkar that we can make, from the varying forms of the remembrance of our Lord that we can make, stating La ilaha illallah is one of the easiest of the adhkar to state. It is one, one of the easiest of the remembrances of Allah to state. In fact, it is so easy that you don't even have to move your lips when you say it. La ilaha illallah. Easy as such. Just movement of the tongue. So we first want to look to what it is that we are aspiring to become within our faith. Our Lord, Azza wa Jal, our Lord, the mighty and the majestic, He has stated to us, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ للناس. You all are the most virtuous. You are, 
you all are the most excellent of the people to ever emerge amongst the people. You all are the best of nations to ever emerge amongst, amongst the people. So you are the best of the best. You are the creme de la creme. You are the cream of the crop. You say, why? Our Lord explains to us why. تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنَ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ You all enjoin the good. You forbid the evil. And you have iman. And you have faith in Allah. So let's unpack that. 124,000 prophets, 315 messengers, 104 books that have been revealed. Each prophet with a nation that he was sent to. Yet in the finality of revelation, our Lord explains to us in the chapter Ali Imran that you all are the best out of all of them. So then we should understand that and we should carry it with some dignity. But in order to become the entire of that state of excellence, there are some things we have to do. We have to be people that we want the good not only for ourselves, but we want good for other than ourselves as well. We want guidance for ourselves but we want guidance for other than ourselves as well. This is one of the lessons that we learn in Surah Al-Fatiha, in the first chapter of the Qur'an. When we make the dua, the supplication that is in Al-Fatiha, we state, Ihdina, Ihdina Salatul Mustaqeen. We ask Allah to guide us to the straight path. And we do not say, Ihdini. We don't say, guide me. I just want guidance for myself. We say that we want guidance for everyone. Meaning, you are actually supposed to desire within yourself guidance for the remainder of humanity that is outside of yourself. Imagine that. So then, when we speak to enjoining the good, this means that we are inviting the creation to Allah to all things that are good. Shara'in wa aqlin. They are all good, both legislatively and with regards to reason and logic. Reason and logic that is in alignment with our legislation. And when we are forbidding that which is evil, we are forbidding all things that are evil. Shara'in wa aqlin. We are forbidding all things that are evil legislatively and all things that are uh, evil in a state of logic and reason. We find it to be qabih, we find it to be ugly and repugnant. So then we seek to repel it from ourselves and from other than ourselves as well. Then our Lord states that we were took minun billah, and you all have iman in Allah. The meaning here is that you have a state of faith that within this state of faith, you don't have doubt in your faith. You don't doubt your belief in Allah. You don't doubt your belief in the angels. You don't doubt your belief in his books. You don't doubt your belief in his messengers. You don't doubt your belief in the last day. In the last day meaning all the things that occur from death forward through the reckoning into paradise or hell. And you do not doubt your belief in the qadr. You do not doubt your belief in fate. You do not doubt the knowledge of Allah, the wisdom of Allah, the record of Allah of recording all things to be from the time of the creation of the pin until the day of resurrection, 50,000 years before our creation as we know it to be now. You don't doubt any of that. And... In your being adamant, in your iman, in your having certainty, in your faith, you support the faith you have in your heart with action. So then you support it by acting in accordance with the faith that you possess. 
Hassan al-Basri, may Allah bestow mercy upon his soul, he mentions something interesting when he states, لَيْسَ الْإِمَانِ بِتَمَنِّي وَلَا بِتَحَلِّي That iman, that faith, it is neither wishful thinking, nor is it some decorated ornament, but rather it is that which is firmly settled inside of the heart and is substantiated by action. So then the origin of faith is inside of our heart. But you see, once a man truly settles inside of the heart, it cannot simply remain there. It must manifest itself upon the tongue so that you are, so that you are speaking in accordance with the faith that you have inside of your heart on some level to some degree. And it can't just simply stay on your tongue. You have to act in accordance with the faith that is upon your heart and that you're speaking in alignment with it upon your tongue on some level to some degree. And the goal is to find alignment and a union between the faith that is in our heart, the statements that are upon our tongue, and the actions that are upon our limbs. Okay. That's what we are aspiring to. But what is the description of the individual who possesses this iman, who possesses this faith? Our Lord discusses this with us in the chapter that you all are well aware of, and it is called Mu'minun. It is called the chapter of the people of Iman, the chapter of the people who possess faith. Qad aflah al-mu'minun, Allah states. Certainly, the mu'minun, they are successful. Certainly those who possess Iman, who possess faith, they have success. In success here, it means fit dunya wal akhirah. In success here, it means that you are successful in this life as well as in the hereafter. Because of the Iman, because of the faith that you possess. Then our Lord he provides us with a description of such people. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Those who, within their prayer, they have humility. They have concentration. They understand that they are in private discourse with their Lord when they enter into a state of prayer. They understand that the word salah, the word prayer is extracted from the word sila, which means a bond, because the prayer is the strongest bond that you have with your Lord. They understand that you are humbling yourself before your Lord in your obedience to Him. They understand that when you enter into your prayer, you are striving for hudud al-qalb. You are striving for your heart to be present inside of the prayer that you are praying. You're not just going through some mechanical motions and statements. You are building your relationship with your Lord. And you are seeking to maintain your daily appointment with your Lord no less than five times in a day. Okay. 17 units in a day. Maintaining that appointment. If you are striving for the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, as a sunni, then you are striving for 50 units in a day as a regular routine as he would do. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ مُعْرِدُونَ And those who, when it comes to idle talk, vain speech, they turn away from it. This is the description of who? Of the mu'minun, of those who possess iman. They turn away from lagu. What does that mean here? This means those things that our disobedience to Allah in our speech, they turn away from that. Those things that they may not be sinful, but they're disliked by your Lord, they turn away from such speech. May Allah grant you excellence. These individuals, they turn away from this idle talk. And those, when it comes to zakat, when it comes to 
charity, be it the annual almsgiving, or be it voluntary charity, they are fa'ilun. They do that. They are people who are charitable. Your faith, this iman that is inside of your heart, it makes you a charitable person. It makes you want to give to others, to extend from yourself to other than yourself. This is the nature of iman when it is within us. Okay. And by way of this charity, we understand that we are purifying ourselves. This is from the base meanings of zakat. Zakat means to purify. You are purifying yourself and you are purifying your wealth by way of extending it to other than yourself. This is the spiritual understanding and practice that is taking place here. But charity, it may not only be, it may not always necessarily be money. It can be a skill set that you have. It can be an opportunity. It can be you interceding on behalf of another individual. It can be you're providing a smile for your fellow brother in faith or your fellow, your fellow sister in faith. What's the next characteristic? In those, when it comes to their private areas, they safeguard them, meaning they strive for chastity. Except for with their spouses or with their right hand possessions, for in that case, there is no blame upon them. And whoever goes beyond that, then such people are in transgression. And those who, when it comes to the amana, when it comes to the trust, when it comes to your agreements, they care for them. Your word is bond. You made an agreement with this person, Muslim, non-Muslim. You seek to uphold the agreement. There's someone that has entrusted you with something. Maybe it's a secret. Maybe it's some possession of theirs that they have that they've given you to look over. Whatever it is, big or small, it's an amana. Between you and your Lord that you have with this person. So then you uphold that. Why? Because of your iman. Because of your faith. And such individuals with their prayers, you have They safeguard their prayers. But what is interesting here, our Lord utilizes a present tense verb for safeguarding. You say, why is that relevant? See, earlier you stated have he stated in a noun form. Now he utilizes the present tense verb form. Why is that relevant? Well, the fi'l mudari' yudullu ala istimrar. A present tense verb is indicative of continuity. Meaning you pray, but you're not praying once. You continue to pray. You don't just pray all your prayers and you're mindful of your prayers today. This is something that you're doing as a constant practice ad infinitum, continuously into the future. That's your norm that you're seeking to maintain those prayers. Then our Lord states, explaining to us the characteristics of the people of Iman, of the people of faith, Ula'ika humul warithun. Such individuals, they are the inheritors. And herein lies our question. We've heard the description of the people who have faith. 
We ask Allah to make us from them. After providing description, our Lord then tells us that they are inheritors. That they are inheritors. Our question for you all is what is it that these believers are inheriting? Question for the floor. Barakallahu fikum. May Allah bless all of you. I know. I was supposed to come out. I was supposed to do all the talking. I know. I know. What are they inheriting? Reward. Mr. Timberlake says reward. The rest of us say what? Uh, Jannah. Yes. Their faith. Good. We heard something else. We heard Jannah, I think. What else do we, what else we, our sisters are saying? What are these believers inheriting? What do you want to inherit? You did all of this. You should, as jazam and jins al principle in law, that the reward is commensurate to the action. You did all these actions, there's some reward that's there for you. You're inheriting something. Yes? Say it again. What from Allah? Allah will love you. Love from Allah. Allah will love you. Okay. A little bit of tafsir. Can we turn to tafsir just a little bit? A little bit of exegesis. A little bit. Okay. Sunnah first. Though. We're aware that every human being that comes into existence, they already have a place for them in Jahannam and in Jannah. We're aware. Everyone has their place, even you and I, in hell and in paradise. We're aware. Okay. In the grave, the people who will be punished inside of the grave, there will be something that opens for them, something like a window. And they'll be able to see the place in the fire of hell where they are meant to go and the place in paradise where they could have gone. And that's inverted for the believer in the grave. There's something like a window for the believer and you'll see the place in the fire of hell where you could be going and the place in paradise where you hope to go. Okay. So then this means that when, with Allah's mercy and permission, when we all enter into paradise, that means that there are other places in paradise for all those people who went to hell and their places in paradise are open. Such individuals will inherit. So then the people of faith will inherit the places in paradise for all the people who went to hell. Does that make sense? So then you had your reward in paradise, and then Allah gives you even more than what you already have in paradise by giving you what others could have had had they done with you what you have done. Does that make sense? Okay. All this talk about Iman, all this talk about faith, as we reach our, our halfway point here in this, uh, in this reminder. And we have to pose another question. What is Iman? What is this faith that we're talking about? What is it? We hope to possess it. We hope that the Lord increases us in it. We hope that we act in accordance with it. We hope that we earn Allah's mercy by way of it. But what is it? What is Iman? What is faith? We have to know what it is before we talk about rejuvenating it, right? And how to rejuvenate it. So what is it? What do we think? What is Iman? And then there were crickets. <laughs> uh, a belief in the heart. Ah, a belief in the heart. Mr. Stover, yes. Okay, belief in the heart, action upon the limbs. Good. And speech. And speech and statement upon the tongue. Yes. Believing in the books. Good. What books? Like school books? Which books? 
Allah's books. 100% correct. Yes. Believing in the prophets. And the angels. Keep going. Yes. Believing in the last day. Absolutely. Yes. Belief in the messengers. Yes. Belief in the qadr of Allah. Belief in divine decree. Fate. Destiny as it were. Okay. You're all right. There are those among scholarship who define iman based on the definition given to us by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the renowned Hadith of Jibreel, in the renowned prophetic tradition of Jibreel, where there are some questions that Jibreel asks the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he provides answers. One such question, akhbirni an al-iman, inform me about iman. Tell me what faith is. And he says, faith is to have iman in tukmina, to have faith, to have iman, to believe in Allah, in his angels, in his, in his books, in his messengers, in the last day, and the qadr of Allah, faith, the good and the bad thereof. So those who define faith this way, academically. There are others, for reason and with evidence, they define faith as our dear brother, Mr. Stover, has defined. And it is a belief in the heart, a statement upon the tongue, and actions upon the limbs. The three are intertwined and never to be separated. When we separate one from the other, we're asking to diverge from the orthodoxy and the orthopraxy of our faith. We're asking to deviate. Okay. This Iman, is it something that is static? Is it something that's like the lights? So I suppose, yes, there, there are light switches over there, right? If we hit those light switches down, what's going to happen to the lights? Off. We flip them back up, what's going to happen? They come on. Is Iman like that? Is it on, off? You have it, you don't have it? Is there or it's not there? Is that how it is? Yes, no, like what? Like a dim, oh, there's, there's, a, there's a dimmer on the light. There's a dimmer. <laughs> okay. All right. Or is it that Iman is fluid? Is it more like water? Is it more that it flows? Is it possible that there can be more of it and less of it? Okay. Here, we have what? A bottle of water, right? Let's call this bottle a vessel. You know what this vessel represents? It represents your heart. Inside of this vessel, we see water. The water represents Iman. Okay. Is it possible that water can be poured out of this vessel? Is it possible that water can be poured into this vessel? Yes. But the water is fluid. It's constantly being poured in and poured out. The question now becomes, how do we pour water out of this vessel? Disobedience. disobedience to Allah. Good. So then the more we disobey Allah, the less water we have in our vessel, the less faith we have in our heart. How much water can be poured out, out of our vessel? All of it. I heard someone say, all of it. And when all of it is poured out, then this is a person exiting from the fold of Iman and entering into the fold of Kufr. Exiting from the fold of faith and entering into the fold of disbelief. Okay. Or a covering and burying of that faith, if we're being more particular. That's another discussion. How do we pour more water into this vessel? Obedience to Allah. So then the more that we are obeying Allah, the more that we are worshiping Allah, the more that we are doing the things that Allah loves and he is pleased with, the more water that will be in the vessel. However, the heart isn't limited to the size of this water bottle. So then that iman can continue to increase until it is the size of mountains or even greater than that. Okay. 
And as we stated, it can decrease until there's none left. It can also decrease to the point that there is still some water in the bottle, but it's not all the way full. There's enough in there that you have the foundation of faith, but your faith isn't whole and it's not complete. Does that make sense? Okay. Now that we know what Iman is, and we know how to increase Iman, we have to speak about something. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, on that uh, same line of thought. Please. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a man to be led to believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also a man to well jannah, mm -hmm. to uh, believe his jannah. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. May Allah be with you ever so kind. Now, it is easy to talk about the increase of faith. That makes us feel good. But as we stated, Iman is fluid. And as uh, Sufyan ibn Uyayna has mentioned, Rahimahullah ta'ala, whatever goes up must come down. So just as we can navigate the increase of our faith, after the increase, there is a decrease in faith that we're going to experience. So how do we navigate that? We offer you firstly the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ma min abdin mu'minin. There is no believing servant. There is no servant who has iman. Illa walahu dhinbun. Except that he has a sin. Ya'taduhu al-fainata ba'd al Except that he has a sin that he does sometimes. Every once in a while. There's a, a certain sin that each one of us have that we, that we do. Oh, Zinbun. Or he has a sin. And he is settled upon that sin. He is affixed upon that sin. لا يفارقه حتى يفارق And he doesn't depart from that sin until he departs. وَإِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنِ خُرِقَ مُفْتَنًا تَوَّابِ النَّسِيَّةِ And the mu'min, the person of iman, the person of faith, he has been created as one who has put to trial, one who's tested. One of the signs Allah loves you, He tests you. As one who is tawab, one who is penitent, He's constantly repenting for His misgivings, meaning He's on a journey of self improvement. You're going to slip, you're going to fall, you might even embarrass yourself. But you don't stay down there. You continue to attempt to make yourself better. Nasiya. And he forgets. That's homo sapien. We forget a lot. In fact, humanity has only been given the name insan, as Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, has mentioned. In the insana, in the masumiyat insan, Humanity has only been given the name Insan because he entered into a contractual agreement with his Lord and then after that, he forgot about it. He forgot about it. Okay. In fact, there are linguists who mention that the word Insan is extracted from the word Nasin, one who forgets. Hitherto, in completing this prophetic tradition, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam states, but when he's reminded, he remembers. This is us. So then we remind each other because we all know that we are in a similar predicament. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made commendation and salutation be bestowed upon him. He also has mentioned. Inna li kulli amalin shirratin. Every action. It has its period of activity. 
It's a period of enthusiasm. When you first get that book, when you first learn about a certain act of worship, when you first have the opportunity to, you get excited about it. And you're active, you're diligent, you're on that particular act of worship or opportunity that's given to you. And every period of activity also has a period of inactivity. So whoever's, whoever his period of inactivity is upon my sunnah, then he is guided. And whoever his period of inactivity, lack of enthusiasm, lack of drive, because we all experience that, is upon other than that, then this person will perish. So faith, it increases and it decreases. So when it decreases, we don't just do anything. You try to maintain some level of sunnah. You try to maintain some constant for yourself somewhere. Because what ends up happening is, it's an exercise. So you put in the effort during your period of activity and you bring your iman here. And then you plateau, you settle. And then you're going to decrease somewhat. But you're not going to be all the way back down where you started at. You may not be as high as you were, but you're not back down at the bottom again. So then you come down a bit and you plateau. You maintain that plateau upon the sunnah until you get another burst of activity, energy, enthusiasm, and you ride that up. And then you're going to come down a little bit and you're going to plateau. You maintain that. Now you're higher than you were the last time during your previous plateau. This is how you maintain your faith and you rejuvenate it. Does that make sense? Okay. Just so we don't give up hope. And we're coming closer to a close. We offer you a prophetic tradition that we know you all are familiar with. Hanitha comes of Bukhari, a Muslim. It is the hadith of the man who committed murder 99 times over. Okay, we're familiar. Okay. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he informs us that there was a man from the children of Israel and he committed murder 99 times over. And we hear this, but I don't know if we grasp the gravity of that. You hear the term serial killer? You know what that actually means? This is what it means. This is in accordance with the Federal Bureau of Investigations. This is their definition for it. That the person commits two murders, two murders back to back within a short period of time. And then after the short period of time, there may be a two week or more cooling off period before the person returns back to it. Two. This person, 99 times over. Okay. Yet, even with this, you all told me disobeying Allah does what to faith? Decreases it. Murder? Sin? Yes, major minus sin. It's a major sin. So how much is that impacting the faith of the individual? Yet, he still had enough faith left in his vessel that he asked a question. Who is the most knowledgeable person on the face of the earth? He understands that he needs knowledge in order to rectify his situation. I took 99 hours without do right. I need to know how to fix this. So I need to talk to somebody who knows. So he goes to seek out that knowledge. He's directed to a monk, a worshiper, a virtuous person. However, this virtuous person, this worshiper is not necessarily a person of knowledge. He's directed to this individual. He goes to him and he states to him that I've committed murder 99 times over. Fahelman Toba, can I make Toba? Is there some forgiveness for me? 
What's he tell him? Said no. And then what did he do? Then he killed him. What came it be me? And then he completed a hundred souls. Well, if I'm not forgiven anyway, if you can't help me, I might as well kill you too. See, ignorance can cost you your life. You can't fake knowledge. You can't feign that which you don't possess. The one who doesn't have it can't give it. Okay. Then he asked the question again. Who is the most knowledgeable person on the face of the earth? And don't tell me it's that monk because I just killed him. So who's next? So then he's directed to one who is erudite, an alim, a person who possesses knowledge, an academic. So he goes to him and he tells him he's honest. And he says, not I've killed 99 people. And now he tells him, I've killed 100 people. Is there forgiveness for me? Now the person that has knowledge, what does he tell him? Who is the one that can come between him and his, and his repentance? Who can become between you and Allah? No one ever can come between you and your Lord. Then he gives him further advice. That's the answer to his question. But he recognizes the situation, so he tells him something more. He says, go off to the land of such and such. Out in that land, there are people there who they worship Allah. So you go out there and you worship Allah with them. Meaning what? Meaning our environment can also have impact upon our faith. So we, if we are looking to rejuvenate our faith, we place ourselves in the environment that will allow us to rejuvenate our faith in the best of states. Meaning, we want to be in a positive environment, a worshipful environment, an environment where there are other believers, an environment where there's the worship of Allah taking place, the remembrance of Allah taking place. This is what is going to assist us whilst we are striving to increase our faith and rejuvenate our faith. Okay. So then he does so. He sets out. But then he dies. Atahumot. Halfway there. So now, the angels descend upon him to take his soul. The angels of mercy and the angels of punishment. What do the angels of mercy say? Ja'ata'ibin. Muqbidan. In Allah Ta'ala. Look at him. He's come. He's repenting to Allah. He's turning his heart. He's opening himself up to Allah, ready to receive. What do the angels of punishment say? This person has not put forth one good deed ever. Imagine that. And if he has not put forth one good deed ever, guess what we have to include inside of that? Salah. Potentially, he wasn't even praying. We follow. If so, they would have. They said he has not done one good deed ever. Okay. So they're in dispute. So then another angel descends in the form of a human being out of honor to humanity as a judge between the two of them. And then that angel tells them, measure between the two lands. Either one of the two of them that is closest to will be the land that he is affixed with, and those will be the part of the angels that take his soul. So then they measure it, and they find that he is closer to the land that he was going to, and further than the land that he was coming from, so then the angels of mercy take his soul. In another narration, Allah ordered the earth, the land that he was going to, to move closer to him, and the land that he was going from to move away from him. To assure that the angels of mercy took his soul. All because he navigated the decrease of his faith. And he strove to the extent of his ability. He never actually did the good deed. He never got there. He never got to the land. He didn't do that. He never worshipped with those worshippers. He didn't do that either. But he made the effort in his making his effort, this effort alone. Allah acknowledges that and rewarded him based on that and forgave.
So if we understand this, it's not necessarily about reaching the end of the journey. It's about navigating your own individual, unique, spiritual path. Does that make sense? You are being judged about how you are navigating your path, not necessarily how far you get along that path. Does that make sense? Okay. That which can assist us in getting into this space of rejuvenating our faith is looking up to those who have preceded us. Because in the Fatiha, we state, We're asking Allah to guide us to the straight path, right? What's the straight path? Our Lord details that for us in the next verse. And then we say, and I'm to alayhim, the path of those who you have bestowed your grace upon them. These are the examples we're taking. We're looking to the people who have preceded us, that Allah has bestowed his grace upon them, so that we can emulate them, so that we can do what they did, so that we can get what they got. Does that make sense? Our Lord explains to us who those people are in another chapter in Surah An-Nisa. Wa and whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger, then they will be in the company of those people that Allah bestowed His grace upon them. Bestowed His grace upon them where? In Al Fatiha. Min al Nabiyyin, wa Siddiqin, wa Shuhada, wa Salihin. From the prophets, the truthful, the martyrs, and the righteous, and what a superb companionship they are to have. Wahasuna ulaika rafiqa. So then, an exercise that we can perform. We know that we all we all read books here, and we read online, and we get different reminders and benefits and things like that. We know that we do that. We submit to you to begin doing this. The lives of your favorite Sahaba, male, female, start reading about their lives. Learn how they lived. Learn how they worshipped. And then begin doing some of the things that they did. You know the scholars of Islam that you see the names at the bottom of the book, but you really don't know nothing about them? Start learning about their lives. Read, read often the biographies in the beginning of the book. Take those extra few minutes, start reading their biographies. Learn some, glean some nuggets from their lives and begin striving to emulate them in what they did. Like what? Did you know Uthman ibn Affan was amongst the people who would stand in prayer at night and recite the entire of the Quran in one rak'ah, in one unit of prayer? And that was not irregular for him. We can go generations after. Ahmed ibn Hanbal, we've heard the name before. Rahimahullah. Did you know as a regular practice, he would pray between Maghrib and Isha? Not pray Maghrib, not pray Isha. He would pray between Maghrib and Isha. It's a forgotten sunnah. We can go further down the line. Abdul Ghani al-Maqdasi, Rahim Allah Ta'ala, he passes Ahmed ibn Hanbal 241. Uh, well, we said Uthman, Uthman 36. Ahmed ibn Hanbal 241. Abdul Ghani al-Maqdasi, 600, 600. As a regular practice, between Fajr and Dhuhr, 300 raq'ah. 300 units of prayer, regular practice. That was their norm. Then sometimes we think we're doing something, right? So then we, we begin to see how they were and what they did, how they were with, with, with charity and such, how they would look in on, on, in on each other and care for one another, and then begin to instill what we're able to into our own lives. When we do that, we're going to have examples of how to rejuvenate and maintain our faith. Does that make sense? That means my job is done. Hadha wa lahu a'lam wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Barakallahu feek.